So welcome, I'm Kate Schaefers, and I am the director of Osher Lifelong Learning Institute here at the University of Minnesota. And I am just thrilled to be your host today and to be here with you today. I'd like to start with the University of Minnesota land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It's important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase aspect to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. So welcome to Headliners. Since 2016, Headliners has engaged audiences interested in current events and cutting edge scholarship. This is our first in-person event since March of 2020, and we couldn't be happier to be here in person, so thank you for coming out today. And let's just say, we all breathed a sigh of relief when the snow stopped. <laughs> yeah. So I want to do a quick poll. How many of you have come to a Headliners event in person in the past? Oh, lots of you. How many of you joined us during Zoom time? Okay. And who is this a first time attending? So we have a real mix here. So thank you for all of you who stood with us through the whole pandemic. Thank you for those of you who are new. I think this is really exciting to be back in person. Before we start today and I introduce our moderator, I'd like to also just tell you a little bit about Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Ali is part of the College of Continuing and Professional Studies, which serves learners of all ages, from high school students to retirees. Ali is a learning community of almost 1,000 people age 50 plus. We offer non-credit courses, special interest groups, events, and opportunities to connect with other curious lifelong learners. We also have an amazing curriculum. This fall, we offered 82 courses, and it ran the gamut of interests. And our winter term is starting soon in January 9th, and we have another great lineup of courses. So our, our members have opportunities to enrich their knowledge of the classics, to understand the causes of the American Civil War, to learn about how insects, insects influence world cultures, or to dive into the biology of aging. And of course, we also offer several courses on the environment, sustainability, and climate action. And we're also much more than our courses. We're a learning community where people can connect with other learners and engage with others in just for that joy of learning. And our members tell us that they come to us for the courses, but they stay for the community. If you want to learn more, we have some, um, some brochures out by the desk. Also check out our website. Um, our winter guide is up there now, so you can check out what's current. And I also do want to mention, too, that Ali is a proud member of the University of Minnesota Age-Friendly Council. And this is the university's efforts to make the university welcome for people of all ages. The University of Minnesota is part of the global network of age-friendly universities. So now, on to tonight's event. Our theme tonight is Our Choices, Our Voices, Stemming the Tide of Climate Change. And to get us started, I'd like to introduce Bob Stein, Dean of the College of Continuing and Professional Studies, who will be moderating our discussion today. So Bob, welcome, thanks for being here. Okay, thanks Kate. Oh, that's loud. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight. I was visiting with quite a few of you and I'd love to see all the hands that went up. Uh, people who have been at Headliners before. And a number of people say, you know, why the venue change, all that sort of stuff. So obviously you all know the pandemic's been happening for the past two and a half years and our first time to get back together in person. And the, uh, the venue where we used to be, the conference center in St. Paul, we no longer have access to that. Um, when the pandemic occurred, everything that we did in that building went online overnight, literally. And most of it has stayed online. And so the vast majority of the uses that we had, those folks are not coming back. And um, here at the university, we have to pay for every square foot of space that we occupy. And uh, we had about 10 times more space in that building than we needed. And so we vacated the building, actually. And so that's the reason for the venue change. And then also Anastasia Founts, who many of you remember, uh, did headliners. It was actually 2006, not 2016. Um, she has a different job in the college now. So, so we're trying something new, and, and I think a number of folks we said, tell us how we're doing. 
I think we'll do another one of these in the spring and, and we'll see how it goes. Obviously, we're doing a panel tonight too instead of just one person, so looking forward to doing that. Um, so the, uh, we're gonna hear tonight from this panel of experts about the various perspectives around climate change, something that affects us, it feels like more and more on a daily basis. Um, we constantly hear or see in the news about events where climate change is maybe mentioned explicitly or maybe implied, things like floods, hurricanes, wildfires, droughts, invasive species, sea level rise, and it goes on and on and on. And the news at times seems grim and relentless and sometimes it feels like there is no hope for us. Or if you have grandchildren like we do, you wonder what the world is gonna be like for them. So tonight's session is gonna take us in a slightly different direction though. Uh, we are gonna hear from these folks who will help us understand what's happening in the world right now, but also to remind us that, there, uh, that even though the situation is challenging, there are things that we can do to change the trajectory of climate change. Uh, tonight's about hope and it's about agency and the need for both individual and collective action because there are things, and you're gonna hear these, there are things that each of us individually and collectively can do to address climate change. So I'm looking forward to the conversation we have. We'll make sure you have an opportunity to interact with the panel tonight, to ask questions. I'll be moderating that a little bit. We'll try to get into some discussions with that. Uh, look forward to that. So before we have each of the individuals uh, give us about five or seven minutes perspective on their take on climate change, we're actually going to introduce each panelist, give them a minute or so to tell us about them. And we're doing it in a fairly unique way. Um, if you were in here earlier, you may have seen it, or you can go online and find sort of their credentials, the work that they do and so forth. But what we asked everyone to do is provide a picture and introduce themselves using that picture and why it is that they do the work that they do. And Kate asked me to supply a picture as well, so I'm going to begin. Here it is. Uh, actually, I had to use two pictures. Um, but, uh, but, I know, she said it's cheating. So on, on the left, you see, uh, you see Steve, uh, I'm the dean, I get to do that, I guess. But uh, <laughs> on, on the left, you see Steve Brennan, who uh, completed a master's degree in integrated behavioral health a few years ago. That plaque he's holding, he, was, he won a national award as a continuing education student. On the right, you may have seen Betty all over the place this spring. This is Betty Sandinson. She graduated with an undergraduate degree in multidisciplinary studies this spring from our college at the spry age of 84. It's never too late. Um, and you, you see the staff on there. She actually uh, staffed one of the information booths at the state fair, came in every day to do that. And so this is why I do the work I do now. Is, uh, this is representative of thousands of students that we serve every year in the College of Continuing and Professional Studies. So that's me, and that's why I do this work. So uh, Heidi, I think you're up next. Oh, no pressure. I only got one photo. <laughs> <laughs> And I only have a minute, but uh, this is myself and my husband, Peter, who's also a professor uh, here at the university. Um, and we are sitting on a rare part of exposed rock in the Taylor Glacier area of Antarctica. And a lot of my research has focused on generating information about Earth's climate system, how it works and how it's worked in the past. Um, but at this moment, um, I had, in that same season, spent time in Greenland and was having a bit of crisis of confidence and no idea what I was going to do with all the scientific training I had. Um, I knew that it was important to understand climate change, but I felt an immense urgency to help do something about it. And I firmly believe that science is critical to our solutions. Um, but in this moment of sitting here with my husband, who's on is trying to get to Antarctica right now, he's in a hotel in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, having a grand old time, because it's summer there, by the way, um, just for those of us who are navigating the snowy winters, um, but really started to ask myself, um, with the privilege of doing the work that I do and being part of generating knowledge, how do I actually bring that knowledge into action? Um, and while I still contribute to Antarctic research and a range of climate science research, um, I, I actually, in the moment, um, in Greenland, this is just following this, this photograph, so this field season, the subsequent field season from Greenland applied for a job to focus on 
the communication of science and how to bring science into decision making um, at the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group. And it was that job opportunity, that moment, um, much like this one, um, that ended up changing my career. And now I have the privilege of working with folks like Jessica um, and a range of students and faculty and staff and people on the landscape doing stuff about climate and working in close partnership to do that work. And so while I love the isolation and I got to meet my husband in Antarctica, um, it's really the privilege of connecting these faraway places to the things that matter to us most. Um, our homes, our families, our lives, and our livelihoods. And so that is me in a picture. Great. Thank you. Ashok, you're next. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'm good to see so many people with interest in, in these important topics. So here it is. I mean, uh, here we are talking about equality and... Uh, uh, the fish, the elephant, and all of these are expected to climb the tree to be successful for finding a job. I mean, let's guess which one will end up getting the job. The monkey. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So that, that tells uh, <clears throat> where the society is and where things are here. And in terms of climate change, uh, it's climate change and sustainability are two very popular word, in good sense and in bad sense. I mean, sustainability, everyone talks about, climate change, everyone talks about. My interest in, in this uh, came from a course I used to teach called Garbage Government and the Globe. Yeah. And, and, and that, I taught this course for tens of years probably, and, and, <clears throat> and I used to think if humans are the one who did everything, if the climate change or unsustainability is because of humans, and then we expect humans to fix it, I don't know how, I, how good it will work. So, so, so uh, uh, <clears throat> and then what should we do? And that's where my grand challenge course came in with that I'm teaching right now. It's psychology. It's, it's us. We have to think differently. And unless we think differently, no matter what, how much research we do, it's not going to work. And the problem with we think differently is that almost 50% of Americans think climate change is not real. And I, I think the problem with climate change is the name climate change, because climate do change. So the, I mean, if the humans were not there, still climate will change, and climate changes. They should have given some better name, like, I like the global warming. I mean, global warming had some trajectory. Climate change, people say, well, the climate changes, so what's the big problem? So I will, I don't know how, but I will tell all the scientists to change the name again. They changed the Anthropocene, they, they made Anthropocene uh, epoch, so why not, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Jessica, you're next. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Hellman. Um, I am an ecologist, a climate scientist. I have the great privilege of directing an institute here at the University of Minnesota called the Institute on the Environment. And I like to show this photo. This is a photo of myself. Uh, my mom actually just randomly one day uh, sent me a whole batch of old photos and an email <laughs> saying, I scanned these into the computer, here you go. And I grabbed it and I thought, actually, this is a story that I would like to include often when I talk about climate. <laughs> Heidi's very good at doing this. Um, that uh, why do I work on climate change or for that matter biodiversity or other kinds of issues related to environmental science? is partly a function of who I am and what I care about. I am a scientist. I'm really good at considering data. I think I'm a good empiricist. I can make models. I, I show my cards. I'm open to changing my mind. But I also am a product of my upbringing. So this is um, my parent. We have sort of a hobby farm in central Indiana. Bob and I were talking earlier. Uh, we share uh, Hoosier roots. Mine are agricultural, largely in origin. And that definitely influences my thinking about the world. I 
see the world from a stewardship and a, and a land management point of view often uh, times. And we also were very much encouraged as children to spend time outside. And that appreciation for nature is something that comes from my upbringing as well. So when I show up at venues like this and we want to talk about uh, how the world is and how the world could be, I want to bring both myself, who I am and what my experiences are and what I know, and be honest about those things and also bring my scientist self and my, and my data and my um, scholarly knowledge. So I share a picture of childhood. Okay. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, we, as a result of this picture, we found out we grew up in towns about 25 miles apart in yeah. uh, east central Indiana. And we and like basketball. We like basketball <laughs> a lot, and uh, both in very agricultural settings, so a lot in common. So, Fred, you. Um, so, this is a picture taken on a street in New Delhi about 10 years ago, really the opposite of Greenland and Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> it's crowded and hot. Um, so starting around the year 2000 in, in my previous career in corporate life, I started to spend a lot of time in India and China and other developing economies, but mostly in India. And, and while I was there, I really started to realize that, that there are billions of people in, in these countries that want a middle class life just like all of us have. And, and in order for them to do that, society, we can't do that and use resources the way we did in the West. And so I, I really started to think about that a lot and say, how do we create jobs and businesses that allow people to you know, do their life, but also do it in a sustainable way that helps solve some of these challenges we have, like climate change and, and other issues. Um, so eventually, I. I, I left my corporate job and, and started an organization and eventually ended up at the Institute on the Environment um, and working with Grand Challenge courses, et cetera, and started to teach um, international courses. So this was a course in New Delhi. I was teaching with um, uh, these two students, Eric and, and Mina, and they, in a social entrepreneurship setting, they were thinking about how how might we increase um, the business for some of these street vendors? And if um, they can be clear that they have, are using hygienic methods, maybe people will pay more for that. And, and so they were out, um, spent the summer there trying it. And it turns out that was true. Um, Eric decided not to pursue that. And when he finished his graduate studies, he went to work for the EPA and, and actually was on the front lines in Flint, Michigan when EPA was there with their water crisis. And so this picture kind of summarizes why I changed my career and started working in this space and why I started working with younger people to help them learn how to work on these big challenges and, and develop some agency and empower them to go off and do that. So that's why I'm here. OK, great. Thanks, Fred. Thanks to all of you for your introductions and a little look into people's lives there. So uh, again, we're going to be talking about, and interesting already, the idea of sustainability has come up a couple times, so that may be a question you might have about this. Um, but you know, we're already seeing the ramifications of climate change. In fact, maybe here in Minnesota with the extended drought that we've had, but uh, so shifting weather, weather patterns, uh, more extreme storms, um, these droughts, catastrophic flooding, all those kind of things. So we're going to allow each of these individuals to talk a little bit about their perspective on climate change. Jessica, we're going to start with you. Uh, Jessica just came back from the, the UN Climate Change Conference in Egypt, COP27. You probably read about that in the news. Uh, so interested to hear what you learned from that. What are you going to take back? My first question, though, is did you meet President Biden while you were there? No. OK. <laughs> Uh, but I did brush shoulders with John Kerry. Okay. I don't know if that counts. He was actually there a lot more than mm -hmm. uh, President Biden. So I'm going to stand over here so I can see my own slides. Um, I, we have just a few moments. I uh, believe I was charged with the idea of sort of setting the, the grand stage in some sense. What is climate change? What are the major issues confronting us? How do we wrap our head around those uh, fundamental issues on sort of the global and scientific scales. And I thought actually 
accomplishing that by talking about the recent or the currently ongoing COP27 uh, meetings might be a good way of doing that. So when we say COP or we talk about the UN climate meetings, what we're actually referring to is something called the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was a framework that was established in the Earth Summit in 1992, if you remember back then. And that framework established, there were parties to that framework and signatory or signatories to the framework convention became parties. And then every year there's a conference of the parties. And the United Nations is a party, 190 countries, I think that's right, maybe a couple more than that, are parties to the UNFCCC. Every year they get together around November-ish and that's called a COP. And we started counting. COP 1, COP 2, <laughs> COP 3, COP 27. Um, those of us who remember 1992, I kind of think about this global process that we do as one of steady progress. And I might be frustrated sometimes that we haven't moved more quickly. But Fred referenced talking with students. When you talk with our undergraduates, they were not alive in 1992. And COP27, this COP process is something the world has been working on the entire time they have been alive, uh, which is a slightly different perspective. So here we are, uh, the University of Minnesota gets to take a delegation of students. We have seven badges, which we can turn into 14 participants. So we send a group for the first week and a different group for the second week. And then we also, uh, in this trip, this, this is just Goop Connect and I are the sort of faculty mentors in this, in this team. So here's our group, our week one uh, delegation. Next slide, Kate. So what is the COP or the Conference of the Parties? What is it like? It's actually two things, or three, but we'll, um, I'll start by explaining two. It is a global negotiation. So the parties come to the COP to continue the process of shared agreements and understanding about how we will tackle greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation collaboratively. Uh, so here's a photo of one of the negotiation sessions. I think this is when they were working on, um, uh, actually I don't remember what this one is, because <laughs> I thought it was a different photo. Uh, we'll say they were working on global adaptation goals. The other part of the COP is just a big conference. Uh, so this is a photo that uh, there are um, building after building after building of what we call pavilions. Each country, each party has a pavilion. I think they may have even started as literally the offices, a sort of hangout spot for the parties in the beginning. They have become venues for conversation, uh, for presentation. So this is a, fi a picture of the US center. So you would stroll around here and you would find Japan and you'd find Saudi Arabia and you'd find a really, 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 really big, beautiful, um, United Arab Emirates <laughs> pavilion. Uh, you also find corporate ones and NGO ones. And at each of these uh, gatherings, there are presentations and conferences going along. These two universes are intended to be in conversation with one another, F literally in the sense that party members and negotiators are wandering around the conference and they are participating in the conversation. And also, um, sort of in a figurative sense, that it's, it's the presence of the conference and observers like us from the University of Minnesota that have this, that give this sort of feeling of the world being present and paying attention and holding those negotiations accountable. This all happens in what you call the, what we call the blue zone. You have to have official UN badge to be part of this part of the conference. There's a whole nother set of COP that happens at the hotels in the neighborhood where folks are gathering and having conference-like conversations without needing a badge. Next slide. Another critical thing that you do at the conference of the parties is talk with other people. And this is a critical part of what it means to confront climate collaboratively in an international context and domestically, we need to be working together and interacting with other people who are uh, approaching different aspects of this dilemma. So this is a picture of the, uh, we had a meeting with an Egyptian minister, she's an Egyptian minister of 
uh, economy and, and planning. This is actually organized by one of our Humphrey students, Ahmed Khalaf, who was one of the members of our delegation, an Egyptian national and a U of M delegate member, and he arranged this meeting. And we talked with her about the importance and the value of international research and intercultural exchange um, related to capacity building and working on the climate crisis. So this is another thing you do there, is you go and collaborate with others. I think that's my last slide. Um, but I thought I would share with you um, just uh, a few of the major issues as I saw them and experienced them, and as they continue to play out. The Conference of the Parties will last through this coming weekend, and the news cycle will get a little bit more intense about them here in the next couple of days because the negotiations will get more intense to see what we can, agreements we can reach by the end of the party uh, meetings. So I have four items here I thought I would share with you. In truth, they're a mixture of uh, top of mind conversation points and also things I care about. The most important thing that's being discussed at this particular conference of the parties, which we consider the African COP, because uh, it's in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt, um, is what's called loss and damage. Bob made reference to climatic changes that are already happening. There are consequences of climate change now, and largely, I mean, those consequences are borne by everyone. They're especially borne by uh, lower income countries that do not have the financial wherewithal to confront them. So increasing conversation that those countries responsible for climate change have a duty and an obligation for direct cash payments to countries that suffer those consequences in what's considered loss and damage. So there's a discussion about creating a loss and damage fund. Uh, there are several other funds that already exist within the UN framework. Another key thing that's discussed is what we would consider nature-based solutions. This is actually a, a major theme at the meeting, also something that I'm particularly interested in. So, of course, climate change affects nature and biodiversity, but also uh, nature is one of our most powerful tools that we can use to address uh, climate change, both to mitigate uh, its consequences through adaptation or resilience building, but also to sequester carbon and uh, reduce greenhouse gas, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Number three is part of the negotiations are trying to set up what we would call global adaptation goals. Adaptation are all the things that we would do to live with climate change. We have to stop it and we have to live with it, both together, and they're interrelated. Uh, we have global goals on greenhouse gas emission reduction. What should our global goals be around adaptation? It's a fascinating question and something that the negotiations, if they can set global goals, then we can monitor them, we can finance them, we can hold one another accountable for achieving them. And lastly, uh, methane emission reduction is something I'm particularly interested in. It is a conversation at the COP. I think it should be more. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, it's very potent. We have a pretty good understanding of where it's coming from. It's low-hanging fruit and there's a bunch of new technology that helps us understand precisely the emission sources, which uh, presents great opportunities for policies to address those specific sources. Uh, so I will hear about methane in this meeting and my prediction is we'll hear more about it in, even in future COPs. So those are four takeaways for you using COP27 as um, a brief little uh, glimpse into the global negotiations and ongoing deliberations around climate. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Uh, Ashok, you're up next. Um, I think your slide was introductory to what you're gonna be talking about and sort of the uh, differential impacts of climate yeah. change. Yeah. Okay, is it working? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so this is the first slide. It's a good slide and a bad slide. It's a good slide because it tells you in a very dramatic way what is climate change doing. And I mean, you can see there was a hurricane in November. There was a flooding in Kentucky. Uh, two thirds of Pakistan was underwater. All the California fires and, and big drought. The problem here is that if we only talk about apocalyptic situation, then people won't listen. They'll say, ah, it won't happen. So this is good. 
Say the next one, please. Now, here is my interest in, in, in this. As here's the California fire. And we talk so much about California fire, it's climate change. And if you watch news and they only show all these big mansions catching fire. But that's not the problem is. The problem is the, the people living in smaller houses, people living in, in, in uh, <coughs> this tiny, which are their livelihood, they all get burned. They all get destroyed. But very few, very small coverage to that, pro their problem. Where would, where would they? The rich people will, will do fine. Next, please. Yeah. So here is an interesting fact. The planet is divided into two parts. The northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere is all rich and countries. I mean, look at United States, Canada, uh, part of Russia, these countries. And the southern hemisphere are all suffering from climate change. This is a slide of climate change here. So the poor people are more affected by climate change than rich and well-off people are. Next slide, please. So uh, why this difference? Possible causes are that climate change might uh, targets poor and marginalized. I don't think the climate uh, is follows discriminatory process. No, it's it's not the climate. It is what humans have done. It's not the climate what they have done. The conflict between collective and individual climate action. I can do this. We can do this. But sometimes we can do this is different than what I can do. Sometimes they clash. And that clash is prevent from people acting. Opposing views on climate change theory, of course. Some people think, hey, we will not have uh, food. We will not have water. A very apocalyptic view of, and then, then some people say, no, 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 it's, it's, it's nothing. Uh, effect of climate ch this is the biggest problem. Remember COVID? Still we have COVID. But, but how did the entire world shut off to solve this problem? And climate change, uh, our, our, our climate effect is more dangerous than COVID. But half of the people says it doesn't exist because it's not visible, because it's not visible, it's hap happening gradually. And then finally, US politics. I mean, I don't have to say much about US <laughs> politics. <laughs> Next, please. Okay. So some of the negative effects of climate change. Climate change affects ocean, water, food, health. And that includes every aspect of our life. <coughs> but the problem here is that there are rich countries, there are poor countries, and there are countries who are still living in 18th centuries. There are countries, they don't even have electricity. People don't use internet. And, and, and as I showed in my slide, everything cannot be measured by one goal. And, and, and that's where it is. All these things are being changed but we don't see much in US or our rich countries. But if you go to, uh, in, uh, when I go to India, I see the effect. I see the poverty. I see people moving to, oh, to cities. The city where I live, if I jump a little bit, all I see is my people's head. You don't see anything else. Why? Because uh, the poor areas don't have economy. They don't have food. They don't have schools. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a really big issue there. Next one, please. So remediation. How do we fix it? Well, uh, I kind of believe that it won't be easy. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you why it won't be easy. And I'll give you an example. 
Suppose I drive a car and I use fossil fuel, and that car is my livelihood. You come and tell me, hey, this is causing problem. There's a climate change. Why don't you buy an electric car? What would I say? Where do I have $100,000 to buy an electric car? It's, it's not possible. So if, if, if you want to convince me that I am polluting the environment, change, hey, I'm not going to change. And same thing goes on with people whose, whose livelihood will be affected by, uh, by uh, remediating the process. And, and, and I don't know how easy it will be, but, but this came from National Geographic. So who are responsible? Individuals are responsible. Businesses are, cities, nation, and the world. Here's the problem. They all have different goals. I have different goals. I have to feed my family. Business have to make money, right? Cities are squeezed between two up and two down. And nations and the planet, of course, the world, cannot even get along. What the world? I mean, in the US, it's 50% Republican, 50% Democrat, and they don't even talk. So how would you solve the problem? <laughs> Next one, please. So climate change and human behavior. I, ag I agree with this representation. I don't have to tell much if you see, see it in here. It is, it, see, I don't know how to say it, but the energy use, the biggest culprit is use of energy. We use a lot of energy. We live a lot of energy. And, and, and there is called law of thermodynamics. We use energy, we'll pollute pollution. No matter what energy we use, we can use uh, air, we can use water power, we can use sustainable, unsustainable. The law of thermodynamics says if you consume energy, you will produce pollution of some kind. So what I think is, and my view is different because I, I, my research work is related to energy, is some of these issues in here, humans are inherently, inherently unsustainable. We are designed to be unsustainable. Why? Because we have to take care of ourselves. When humans were evolving, they were the weakest uh, species in, in, the, in the surrounding. So they had to be selfish to survive. Their appetite for fossil fuel is not appetite, it's their livelihood. Uh, internet dependent society. Internet is the biggest culprit of energy misuse. Forest we are cutting. Yeah, we eat a lot of beef and we eat a lot of, this is the biggest myth I'm telling you that give up the beef and eat vegetarian food and then it will be fine. I don't believe in it. You know why I don't believe in it? If you go on the field like, uh, like hunters and gatherers lived, yes. But if you don't eat wheat, but you process the vegetarian food, then you become equally unsustainable. If you eat raw vegetarian food, fine. But if you process it, put can it, and then I go and buy a can and eat it, I don't think there's much difference between beef and, and vegetarian food. So it's what we do is the important. Excessive use of fertilizer and pesticides. You know, before humans, or before uh, industrialization, people were doing organic agriculture. These things are pushed on us by the companies. Advertisement. So, uh, but now it is too late actually. Now the, uh, the plants are, are dependent on it. Uncontrolled consumption and ensuing production. Do you know which country produces most pollution? Anyone? China. In the world. India, China, Africa. 
Make a guess. United States. Why? United States is the richest country in the world. Most educated country in the world. Then they should know, right? Shouldn't they? And that's the question. Why doesn't the United States know that what they are doing is wrong? I'm kind of teaching my course here. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. So, uh, Ash Ashok, are you just about done? We need to move on fairly quickly. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. There is another. This is last, right? This last. Good. Good. Okay. Good. Go. <laughs> okay. All right. I have been tasked with the easy question of how do we catalyze action? We just heard some thoughts, and I'm going to give you a few of my thoughts, which I think are sort of a nice blending of what you've heard um, from the panelists so far. But um, And Jessica touched on this already. Um, as I talk about climate solutions broadly, um, when I think about how we balance the equation of climate action, we need to be thinking about two things. How we prevent the problem from getting worse. We hear a lot about this. This is mitigation. This is the reduction of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We do that by producing fewer of them, and we now do that by also actually physically removing it from the atmosphere through magical things like trees, um, and also really magical things like technology that you hear folks like Bill Gates talk about that's important to develop, but yet to be proven at scale. The second piece is preparation, preventing for the change we already know we've set in motion, the things that we are globally already experiencing. There are no winners with climate change, but there are certainly bigger losers. How we mitigate, how we both prevent the problem from getting worse, right, determines how much we have to prepare for. There are limits to our preparation, I'll be clear. But there's overlap in this Venn diagram where we can do one thing or a multitude of things and they bring benefits in that they both prevent the problem from getting worse, they prevent emissions from being produced, and they help build resilience. Things like investing in uh, resilient forests or ecosystems, thinking about building efficiency. If we make healthier, more efficient buildings that are also resilient to the impacts of climate, the people occupying those buildings tend to be healthier, happier, and more resilient to the impacts of climate change when they do come. Next slide, please. So that's sort of the broader context. So this question, Fred has the even harder challenge of talking about how individuals collectively put their hands on the boulder uphill. And so I have just five things to think about as we, we think about this question around catalyzing action, catalyzing action on this big, hard to grapple with, often want to put our heads in the sand um, type problem, right? This is a big challenge. So here, um, I have had the fortune, and um, I don't recommend this, um, I, I agreed to write a book, um, which is <laughs> odd to say and never thought I would. But at any rate, I have a book coming out um, called The Climate Action Handbook, A Visual Guide to 100 Climate Solutions for Everyone. And as a climate scientist, you talked a lot about how bad it is the world is on fire, these things are happening if we exceed one and a half degrees Celsius, so on and so forth, the things you hear often in the news. Inevitably, at the end of every talk would be the same question. What do I do? How do I help? How do I get engaged? That is, in part, our conversation this evening, right? Our voices, our choices. Well, here we are. So I never felt like I had a good answer, and I myself needed to have a deeper dive in my own climate action journey at home. What could I do? I don't have an electric car yet, but it's part of my plan. It's part of my climate action strategy, right? So we all need to find a way to see ourselves in, our, in solutions. And we all have different capacities, resources, perspectives, and expertise to contribute solutions. So, hence the book. Um, nevertheless, here are, is a sneak peek of some of the things in the book. Um, first, center your actions in your strengths and passions. This sounds trivial, but if you're not motivated to do wor the work and get out of bed in the morning, how are we to continue to do the work and act in a way that helps us move the dial forward? Second, use your energy wisely. And I don't mean your furnace. You, we will get there. Commit to communicate. Look beyond the ballot box. That's appropriate as we are now, um, post-election. And create a climate action footprint rather than a carbon footprint. All right. Here we go, these are the five things and I'm going to be brief and we can talk about it during the discussion. Next slide, please. All right, so climate change is an all hands on deck situation and what we shape and create together needs to include a rich diversity of perspectives and approaches. 
Climate change is intersectional. It touches everything we do, the way we get water out of the tap, where the water goes when you flush your toilet, the food on your plate, the road you drive on, the sidewalk you use to get here. Name the thing, and there is a climate consideration or context embedded within that thing that we often take for granted. So we all need to be thinking about our expertise and our perspectives and how those connect to climate solutions or climate change more broadly. So if you're not motivated, you're not gonna be able to sustain the work. So find the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning and find a climate connection there. Next slide, please. Use your energy wisely. Does anybody have an idea about what these three circles represent by size? Availability of energy sources. Pardon? Energy sources? All right, I'm gonna ruin the surprise. The yellow, that's the percentage of Americans who are cautious, concerned, and alarmed about climate change. That blue dot, those are the people who are doubtful or dismissive. That even smaller dot, those are the people who are the dismissive in our country. So we like to talk a lot about that red dot. And we like to use that red dot as a reason why we don't do anything or we don't talk about it or we don't want to have the conversation because it's too controversial. Wrong. 75% of adult Americans want to be able to have a trusted conversation about climate change with someone that is part of their family, their network, their faith group, their company. That's all of you and that's all of us. So we need to use our energy wisely and stop focusing on trying to convince the unconvincible and work with the people who just want to figure out where they fit and how they fit in. So that's also use your furnace wisely and buy a heat pump. <laughs> Next slide. Turns out Minnesotans are also concerned and hopeful and want to see us do more. So I think in our current context, anything above 50% is impressive. 76% um, of Minnesotans are concerned about climate change. 62% of Gen Zers are hopeful that society will do enough to reduce the most severe impacts of climate change. And 64% of Minnesotans think we should prepare for climate change by preserving our critical natural resources. This is a poll that um, we produced with the College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences in September. Um, and I think these insights are important as we think about where we use our energy for conversation and the way that we motivate people to see what we can actually do. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this survey in just a second. Next slide, please. Commit to communicate, right? So that 75%, that big blob, we have to have conversations. A majority of us are concerned about the topic, but only 35% of American adults discuss global warming at least on occasion, and only 33% of adults hear about global warming in the media at least once a week. So, if we don't talk about it, we don't hear about it, clearly it's not gonna be the number one issue, um, despite the fact that it is part of everything. So we all need to commit to communicate. If we communicate and we share why we care and what we can do, that's a critical way that we can catalyze action. Next slide. Look beyond the ballot box. No question, casting your ballot for your candidate of choice is important. It's an important civic duty. And importantly, we also talk about the partisanship of climate change. No question is there a partisan divide, but constituencies across the board, there are significant majorities of Americans, and this is an American context here, want to see their elected officials doing more. There are only 17% of registered voters in the United States said they would prefer a candidate who decide, didn't want to act on climate change. That's not a very big majority, right? Over 58% of registered voters want, would prefer to vote for a candidate who wants to act on climate. So the tides are turning. The conversation is no longer about is climate change real? The conversation now is about what do we do and who is accountable? And to return back to that survey, 83% of Minnesotans want to see their state, local, and municipal governments doing more to confront climate change. Around the same amount want to see corporations stepping up and around 82% report wanting to see individuals, that's you and me, doing more. Again, all hands on deck. Next slide. Climate change is everywhere. I've sort of already stolen my thunder on this slide, so we're gonna go right, skip right through this one because I wanna make sure that Fred gets to talk about climate action from the individual perspective. 
So we hear a lot about carbon footprints. They're really important. But to Shook's point, that there's a lot of blame game happening, and there is actual evidence that carbon footprints were devised in part to shift the blame from corporations and governments to individuals. You are responsible. Count the carbon that you emit and change your behaviors. Travel less, change your light bulbs, so on and so forth. All important. It's part of an ecosystem of action. But we also have to be thinking about the efforts that we engage in, the actions we do that enhance our own individual resilience, as well as that in our communities. And this is where the portfolio of climate action really comes in. So certainly, do all the things that prevent the problem from getting worse. Put your hand on the boulder to help push it up the hill so we can catalyze the collective action we know we need. And I'm not going to steal Fred's thunder, because I know he's <laughs> going to talk about more of the individual things that you can do as you integrate into this broader conversation around catalyzing that action. But we don't have to focus on the deniers, because there are not that many of them. And there's a broad consensus across the American electorate that we want to see more happening across scales. And we certainly want to see the government, all of our governments, across scales of government doing more. And that's a place where we can engage, again. We, I think there's a lot of hope. So I can tell you more numbers. I brought my handy nandy notebook and the polling results. So if you have hard questions for me, I have, I have more facts and figures. But we know those don't change hearts and minds. So Fred, Great. over to you. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks, Heidi. Um, so um, unlike my uh, colleagues, I'm an engineer, not a scientist. So they, I get the job of talking about the practical things. Um, <laughs> boo, boo. I wasn't meant as a dick. <laughs> Engineers, you know. <laughs> um, I survived uh, uh, many years here in the university that way. So. Um, so we've all been in this position, right, where you have a piece of trash and you stand in front of a bunch of bins and you, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> where do I put it? And, and you end up throwing it probably in the trash and feeling guilty about it, that you should have done something else. Um, next slide. So when we think about what should we do about climate change, it's probably worse, right? Do I get a car? Do I do a heap? What is all this? I don't understand all this stuff. What do I do with my house? So I want to help and just give you some rules of thumb to do this. Next slide. So I mentioned in my introduction that um, when I was um, Working in corporate and then later um, when I was here at the university, I, I worked around the world and, and worked with lots of design teams and scientific teams and engineering teams, helping them develop uh, their processes better, um, helping them develop businesses, et cetera. I, I gave workshops in 10 countries. And, and there's no way I could keep track of all those details. And so over the time, I developed um, a set of um, rules of thumbs, heuristics, that I could apply to um, many different circumstances. And I've used those here when I teach Grand Challenge courses, et cetera. So I'm going to give you some rules of thumb to use as you think about climate change and things that you can do. Oh, next slide. So here they are. So, And they're very similar to what you just heard from Heidi. Um, as, as we kind of think about maybe uh, individual action and less at societal or company-wide. But they're um, clean the grid, um, electrify everything, eat less meat, sorry Ashok. Um, when in doubt, <laughs> use less, talk about it, and stay informed. So I'll go through one quick slide for each one of these. So you can't really do much um, with about what the utilities are doing with respect to moving to clean energy. We know that we want the grid to be primarily renewables. But you can make sure that the electricity that's coming into your home comes from um, renewables. And if you go to this website, the Green Neighbor Challenge, it will tell you how to sign up to get um, clean energy uh, uh, for your account. And Green Neighbor Challenge was created by some students here at the University of Minnesota a few years ago. It's now nationwide. And um, it, so utilities have to provide you a way to get clean energy, but they just don't always advertise it very much because it um, uh, doesn't really, um, they don't really make any money on it, basically. And um, 
The Green Neighbor Challenge can also help you estimate your solar capacity. And if you're a renter, um, how you can get green energy uh, or distributed energy credits, I should say, um, or connect to community solar. Next slide. Um, so once you do that, then you want to basically electrify everything. If you only remember one thing from my talk, just remember that, right? Um, as you go through and start to replace these major things that you own, you want to switch them to electric. Um, so the next time you buy a car or the next time you change, have to replace the furnace in your home or the hot water heater, change them into electric or heat pump uh, powered for your hot water heater and, and things like that. Don't worry about it. You don't have to go out tomorrow and call contractors, but as they wear out, um, you should replace them. These are things that last for a long time. And so um, it's, it's the, these are some of the biggest steps that you can do to uh, start to decarbonize your own life. Um, the website Rewiring America has lots of details on this. You know, we could obviously talk all night about all of these things, but um, you know, think about that. And and when you need to upgrade the shingles on your roof, um, think about putting solar panels on there or earlier, and you can get pretty good estimates about how much that might cost or when to do it. Next slide. Um, so eat less meat. Um, you don't have to become a vegetarian, but generally try to reduce your meat consumption. Um, if, if you look at uh, the greenhouse gas emissions over the life cycle of food production, beef is by far the worst, right? It's about 10 times more than chicken or pork and about 100 times more than um, most fruits and vegetables. So it doesn't mean you have to stop. You can still have your hamburger um, grilled out. But just generally, as you think about food and diet and meals, um, decrease your meat consumption. Next slide. Um, and when in doubt, use less. So we've all seen these uh, reduce, reuse, recycle things. Also think about food waste. Food waste, um, generally globally, uh, about 30 to 40% of food is wasted. Um, in, in, when I worked in India, um, a lot of that food would be wasted from the field to the market you know, through spoilage. Here in the US, most of that wasted food is hidden in the back of your refrigerator. And, um, and it, it's not only waste that, that you know, might go into a landfill, but you've wasted all the energy that goes into um, growing that food. Um, and also, just generally, uh, do things to try to conserve energy, to get an energy audit in your home to reduce that, et cetera. But remember, we can efficiency ourselves to zero. No matter how efficient you make your home, it's still going to use energy. And that's why um, we go back to that earlier slide that I talked about, about electrifying everything. And that's why we want the grid clean, because it doesn't really do any good to be charging your electric car off of power that's coming from a coal plant. OK, next slide. Um, and then talk about it. Um, Heidi talked about this in terms of you know, beyond the ballot box. So family and friends are the most trusted sources. And the way to Im increase your individual um, action and, and have more of an impact is to talk to people about it. Talk to your friends. Um, say you know things that you did that you really like, and it's really going to increase the impact. So all of us up here on the stage have um, done a lot to um, go out and try to impact lots of people. You don't have to get up in front of a group to do that, right? Talk to your crazy brother-in-law next week at Thanksgiving <laughs> and tell him how much you like your induction stove, or how what great acceleration and how much you love that electric vehicle that you have. And try to reframe it, or not around climate change, but around just things that you like and, and the benefits of that. Um, next slide. And then finally, stay informed. So I, I believe um, we're going to email out a resource list. I compiled a list of, of resources and books and podcasts and things that you can reference to either learn more about climate change, learn more about some of these um, individual electrification actions that you might take, 
advocacy organizations if you really want to get involved and whatever is comfortable for you, right? Everybody sort of has their own way of consuming information or how they want to get involved and, and whatever works for you. Um, here, you. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about this. I'm also a um, climate ambassador for Climate Interactive and, and do climate um, workshops for groups. So if you're interested in that, let me know. So again, here are, are the Rules of thumb, is there one more slide? Ah, there is. Clean the grid, electrify everything, eat less meat, use less, talk about it, and stay informed. Thanks. Okay, great, thank you, Fred. <laughs> okay, folks, it's uh, your turn. Now, we have a couple people with microphones that are gonna come around, so if you can, uh, if you wanna raise your hands to ask questions, we'll get a microphone to you. Make sure that folks can hear. Do you have an induction No, not yet. I do. Okay, Ryan, do you mind helping down here? Okay, we have one right here in the front. And you can address questions either generally to the sure. panel or to a specific person. Pertaining. Is this on? Oh, here we go. Pertaining to COP, uh, in the UN, there's a security council. One person can stop everything. Is that true with COP or is it majority rules? The parties deliberate. It's not like the Security Council where there's a group of countries that get to make the final call. Um, it's more consensus based it, and it differs by um, each of the things that end up being negotiated will actually have terms to them. So for example, when the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated initially at COP 11 or 17, well, one of those, um, <laughs> uh, it, they specified that a certain number of either countries had to agree to the protocol or percentage of total global emissions and then it would become officially enacted and everyone would have to abide by it. So that was a a threshold um, uh, uh, triggered um, deal that was negotiated within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Paris Agreement was a voluntary association that sought to get as many signatories as possible. So if you were not on board, you just weren't on board. Uh, so that was a striving toward a consensus-based approach, but there wasn't a go, no go kind of vote about it. In the end, uh, almost all countries did sign on to the Paris Agreement. We were on and then off and now we're back on again. Uh, so it's, a different, it's different than that sort of vote-based. Individual components of it are negotiated and then the terms are negotiated sort of piece by piece. But there are no penalties if you renege. This is true. Under the Kyoto Protocol, there were penalties. The first attempt, so the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was a, it's, a, it's an international agreement. It's like a treaty. And the United States signed that treaty, lots of other countries did. And that treaty made certain claims. We signed on to an international treaty that said we would work to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We also, the treaty also says that the developed world will go first. Uh, will reduce its greenhouse gas emissions before asking the developing world to do so. Then the Conference of the Parties starts coming along. The first official um, terms of that understanding came about in the Kyoto Protocol. And the Kyoto Protocol had targets and penalties for failing to meet, or failing to meet that uh, shared target. It was ratified by a number of countries. It was never ratified by the United States, so we were never bound by the Kyoto Protocol. It lasted for a decade and then expired. It was considered, uh, depending on how you talk about, think about it, either not at all successful <laughs> because greenhouse gas emissions continued to increase, or pretty successful because it was the a good portion of the globe having a go at an international agreement, and it caused a lot of economic transition, especially in Europe. Uh, which Europe now enjoys being a little ahead of the United States in that economic transition. So the, the post-Kyoto world is what we call the Paris Agreement, which is completely 100% voluntary. And that uh, pivot was largely made to attract the United States engagement because we weren't willing to abide by uh, binding targets, but we are on board with voluntary commitments. Okay, we got one over here. Uh, 
I've been impressed lately by the looking into the carbon emissions from everyday activities like the internet, cryptocurrencies, Amazon. Uh, would you comment on how significant those emissions are? Do you want to take that? Who wants to take that? You want to take it? Or Ashok, you mentioned that too about sort yeah. of the, the internet being the biggest mm -hmm. waste, I think I heard you say. Yeah, the internet, uh, those, those big, those big uh, routers and those big computers consume a lot of energy. And in turn, they produce a lot of global warming gases. So more we use, more pollution these companies produce, simply because they have this huge, uh, like Google or all these companies, they have these huge computers or data stores somewhere. And it runs on electricity. It's connected 24 hours a day. So more we use, more pollution they make. Yeah. Um, so on, on the crypto side, maybe with the crash in crypto this week, that won't be such a problem. <laughs> but um, they, it is a large consumer. You know, I can't remember the size of the country that it's equivalent to, but it's pretty big. Argentina. Um, and. Um, you, you start to see a lot of these. Um, I, I'm from North Dakota, and they're starting yeah. to build servers up there, or big server crypto farms, because it's closer to coal plants and cheaper electricity. Um, it, it, there are some advances in crypto that have made the mining less intense. I know Ethereum came out with something just recently. Um, but. Big servers are, are big server farms like Amazon and Google run are, are definitely a, a big source. Um, they tend to be built closer to um, cheaper sources of energy. You're going to see that a lot with hydrogen production too. So one of the ways to decarbonize, so we haven't talked at all about heavy industry, but if you start saying, how do we decarbonize steel plants, right? Um, probably by conversion to hydrogen through some uh, many different ways, but all of that requires cheap electricity, and so those will probably also be built by either big renewable farms or, or things like that. But there is definitely, um, you know, buying from Amazon. You know, not only are you generating carbon in the delivery to you, and thinking about how does that compare to you going and doing it. Big tech isn't always as clean as you think it is, right? Yeah, so I'm thinking as you go down the rabbit hole with YouTube, think about how much electricity you're using, right? So, okay, Ryan, you've got one over here. Hello? Okay. Yes. Um, I've heard it said that it's not our ability to inform but our ability to inspire that changes the world. And I wonder if any of you have any thoughts about that in the context of climate change. I think the climate change is change of behavior. We, the human beings, have to change our behavior, change over the way we live, change uh, the number of cars we have, that's why many people talk about not sustainability, but degrowth is the answer. But are we ready for a degrowth? That's the question. Yeah, I'll just I'll just comment. I think you know just in reflecting on and, and to sort of contextualize this in the in, in climate, um, I think one of our failures is, is not inspiring. And I think another big one, and this is a reflection predominantly on the scientific community who's been asked to talk a lot about climate, is that we facts and figures don't change hearts and minds, but people do, right? Jessica talked about how she's a person and a scientist. Turns out you're both things wrapped in one, right? You can, you can show up with multiple identities. And I think we've overweighted statistics and fear at the expense of both listening and inspiring. And I think we need to be doing more of both of those things. And I think part of it is the challenge, right, is in, in, I see it as we put these catastrophic pictures up. Again, it's, mm -hmm. it's fear. It, that doesn't necessarily change behaviors that 
puts people's guards up. And I think increasingly when I talk about climate, it's, it's about the people that are actually doing mm -hmm. the things, right? There's so much amazing work happening. Is it incremental? Do we need more of it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But right, we had divided government. We have a solar schools program. We have resilience grants for communities. We have deep engaged conversations happening around how we electrify our grid. We have a majority of Americans that want to see clean energy, 100% clean energy by 2050. Over 63% of registered voters want to see it happen, right? And so I think it's about talking and inspiring and showing the work that's already being done instead of talking about all that has, all that we have yet to do or that has, hasn't been done. Because we know that doesn't, it's not gonna move the dial. And yes, do we have to move faster, farther? No question. Um, is there a rosy picture uh, on the horizon? I think so, but only if we lean in inspiration instead of fear. And I, I do think people are equipped to change behaviors. And I think some of that starts with us changing how we talk about the issue and how we show up in engaging people around the issue, right? It's not about climate change. It's, it's about all the things we deeply care about and that are part of who we are as people um, that are part of inspiration. Yeah, I was just going to add all of us, uh, um, all five of us interact with students and young people and it's not, it's becoming increasingly common that our uh, young people are really mm, freaked out. They're very, very upset. Not uniformly so, but more than you know, it, it, um, more than we would like, more than it's sort of healthy to have in some respects, and that is it, something that we've increasingly had to uh, confront. Is it's almost the the other side of the sort of um, guilt-ridden, um, scary rhetoric that is truthful, but maybe not always helpful. But one of the things, so back to your think, point about Inspire, that I feel like I've learned, and I know my colleagues have learned something similar, that we tell our students, you know, what are you supposed to do? All that you can do is strive to make a difference. And what will bring you hope and actually can bring you joy is doing that with other people who want to do the same. And so it is difficult work, and there's reason to be anxious about the future. But there's also lots of inspiring and rewarding things to do to try to make the world a better place and doing it with others can actually bring tremendous joy. Um, and so I think that, that kind of inspiration piece um, has got to be why, the other thing we always get asked is like, do you have hope? Or you know, how can you get out of bed in the morning? And I think like, what the hell else am I going to do? Like, <laughs> yeah. don't like yeah. the alternative, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what what you do is you try to do you try to um, to build a better future, uh, and that's inspiring. I I personally think so. And I'm going to contradict myself, which of course we're great at doing, and you can do that on a panel. Um, which is, right, facts and figures don't change hearts and minds. I'm going to give you a figure, and hopefully um, you all can reflect on this <laughs> as, you, as you leave, which is that in the polling that we recently did in Minnesota, you know, I had that number up about Gen Z years having hope, and it was over, like, 64% yeah. have hope. It turns out the older population in Minnesota, the non-Gen Z years, that number plummets to 30%. So there's also a disconnect there, yeah. right? The, the, the population and the age group who's also clearly in this poll articulated a much higher level of anxiety, feeling climate anxiety either frequently or sometimes, um, that number was much higher, um, but their level of hope was more than double that of other adults in Minnesota. You think so, it's because they're actually engaged? Probably, right? I think it's a really interesting, yes, facts and figures. Maybe that will change your yeah. mind. Maybe. I'll contradict myself again so, in a circle. But I, right, I think that is really interesting to reflect on as we think about how, I think there's obviously a generational gap there. And that's a huge, that's a huge divide and I think speaks to a huge opportunity and also why that list, we need to strengthen our listening bone. And I think that's listening to people who are much younger than hmm. us, or at least younger than us. Yeah, Heidi, your numbers are fascinating to me about these 70, 74% of you know, the voting population wanting something done. And if you just think about the recent election, uh, there's relatively little about climate change and there's about a whole lot of other issues, mm -hmm. but that is perhaps one place where even though there are you know divides across 
political parties still there are the majority of people on both sides who are saying this is something we need to do. So talking to our legislators would be one of those, hey, here's, yeah. here's a conversation you can have. So Kate, I think you've got one back here. Uh, I actually have two uh, questions for Jessica. Uh, one is uh, when you're talking about funding uh, programs in, for example, Africa, yeah. uh, there are two enormous problems, it seems to me. One is that the governments are extremely unstable, yeah. and we trade in one dictator and crook for another one, and so where does that money get spent? Mm -hmm. And the other question I have is you said that since the, or one of you said the solution to methane is uh, soluble, but I see most of the talk here is about production of methane from animals, yeah. but it's my understanding that as the uh, permafrost melts, that that releases yeah. enormous amounts of methane, and, and we certainly can't refreeze it. Yeah. Uh, so this concept of loss and damage, the idea that, um, so in the UNFCCC process so far, there has been created other funds one fund that exists is called the Adaptation Fund, uh, where uh, mostly rich countries make pledges to uh, put money into the Adaptation Fund, and then countries who aren't able to afford adaptation-related projects can draw upon that fund. But it's very project-based. The idea of loss and damage is that dealing with climate change is not always about making investments in projects to adapt to climate change or to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, sometimes, increasingly, it's just aid. It's just disaster response. It's um, something terrible happens and you need resources to deal with it. Hence, that's the idea of the loss and um, damages. I think it's interesting. Uh, personally, it's hard to imagine the wealthy countries getting on board with loss and damage, because you don't see us dealing with a lot of other kind of compensation <laughs> challenges, even within our own country. But it does most definitely affect the conversation. So for example, here even in the last few days, you're starting to hear some of the wealthy countries, including Americans, and I think Biden was, John Kerry was talking about this. Well, maybe it's time to rethink the way that the World Bank operates or the IMF operates, which has historically had uh, quite high interest rates, especially in high-risk countries. Maybe those interest rates should be lower. Maybe there should be more grants than just loans. Maybe we need to think about the debt burden that goes to some of these countries. I think that's my personal uh, expectation is I think that kind of conversation is where the wealthier countries will begin to lean into that kind of loss and damage um, perspective. Methane uh, melting, folk, other folks might have something to say on that. <coughs> Recently I uh, read a, a research work. Some scientists in US have designed a technique where uh, passing methane through aluminum, uh, aluminum oxide uh, nanoparticle, it, it degrades it completely into water. So, hmm. so they are seriously thinking that that could be a technological solution, but it's still in research. research. Um, could, just quickly, ahead. one of the reasons why it's so important to achieve the Paris Agreement is because of these things we talk about, these positive feedbacks. So if we allow the Earth, if literally allow, if we allow the Earth to warm more than a degree and a half or two, we will increase the likelihood that we'll, for example, have mass melting of the permafrost that will release methane. So our greatest possibility of preserving that um, strong feedback that would be a kind of runaway greenhouse effect uh, would be to limit the amount of warming that happens. And that's why this conversation about 1.5 or 2 degrees C is so important. Human sources of methane are livestock. A lot of uh, methane also comes from oil and gas production. Um, so on the methane from, from the permafrost in this climate model that, that I use with Climate Interactive, that's probably one of the more least understood sources of methane in terms of being um, confident about how much it may or may not release. Um, but it, it, so it's definitely a, a problem and it could be a really bad problem, but um, we're not totally sure. And just 
there's a, a project going on in Siberia. I, I can't remember the name, Pleistocene Park maybe, where they're trying to rewild part of it basically by bringing back large, um, not, not mammoths, but mammoth-like animals, bison and stuff to try to help reduce some of the release. If you're interested, you can look that up. Okay, Ryan, you've got a... Yeah, enjoying the conversation immensely here. Those, thank you very much. Um, I'm a real believer of Murphy's Law of Unintended Consequences. And when we think about the renewable energy options out there, have there been studies that have been done that have looked at the mining of the materials, the manufacturing, the transportation, the implementation, and then the disposal of those other renewable options um, and the impact they have versus what they're trying to take care of? Fred, you want to try that one? Yeah, so the short answer is yes. Um, I mean, in some respects, we're moving to um, from a sort of a fossil fuel-based economy to a mineral-based economy, mm -hmm. right, as we start to get some of the minerals that you're talking about, right? Um, and, and we see that discussion in northern Minnesota going on. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I, I can't tell you what those trade-offs are, but but they're definitely happening. What what really has to gain more traction now is the recycling business yeah. of yeah. like lithium batteries. Um, and it's kind of a catch-22 because you can't really scale up a recycling business until you get more batteries there, et cetera. But, but there's no question that all of these renewable technologies, the, the stuff that goes in on the minerals, are, we have to, in parallel with developing it, develop a way to recycle and reuse them. Um, and you know, there's lots of issues with extraction. Extraction tends to take place in countries that have already been extracted out of stuff already, unfortunately. Um, but, but, it, but it's definitely a thing that there's lots of attention on. If you, um, one website that has lots of articles about that is Canary Media, and it's mostly about climate tech, and so there's a lot of venture money going into that space. And um, I would just start to dig into that. But it's, it's, it's definitely at top of mind of a lot of people in that space. Uh, can, no, you want to go on, or do you want? To? Okay. Go ahead, Heidi. If you got no, I, I was going to say. The, so there are a lot of life cycle analyses yeah. out there, and people working to really quantify those impacts. And of course, there are certain things that get missed as we model things. Right? Just models themselves are imperfect and never can capture the system in their entirety. But the short answer is yes. It's we're, there are trade offs, but. Um, in terms of impacts on environment and people, um, there are right fossil fuels aren't impact free. In yeah. fact, right, they come with a lot of costs and consequences, and transitioning brings near immediate health impact, like health benefits and all sorts of other things. So, um, it's not we're basically yes, the transition can can lead to better outcomes um, for people and environment. Um, and I think the big question there is if done right. And so uh, the big dirty word, right, is R for regulatory, right? That part of this is that then involves proper regulation and environmental standards to ensure that, you know, we have to obviously also respect tribal sovereignty and a whole bunch of other issues that are emergent in our state and in our country, right? As we think about where do we extract these, who's proximal to these sites, but I think importantly, is there accountability so that as we do, yes, extract resources, that we're doing that in a way with the least amount of human and environmental impact, and that begs some big questions around who's going to hold, in ultimately, corporations accountable. And I know that's very complex and mm -hmm. a can of worms, but I think right part of the is it's recycling, part of it's extraction, and the part of it is is really reflecting on the environment and the human consequences and who who is at risk um, from these uh, these mining efforts and they're needed and part of that then has to be balanced against who's at risk from the status quo um, and it's pretty the research bears out on both of those things so I think yeah the short answer is yes it comes with impacts but um, the math suggests fewer 
fewer yeah. negative impacts. Yeah. Fewer negative right. impacts. There could be also some cool things that might happen. Um, we need to make a much more circular economy. We need to be able to recycle those materials much more aggressively than we do now. Of course, a lot of materials that we use in non-renewable uh, are not necessarily efficiently collected and reused. But I've heard you know, um, expectations of all kinds of like secondary markets for used batteries. So a battery that goes in your electric vehicle has to be very high performance. As it begins to degrade, you'll need to substitute it out for a new battery. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that that battery isn't still useful. It could then go into a secondary market battery, you know, battery market, which uh, has other applications, and maybe into a tertiary uh, market before it gets recycled and repurposed. So that kind of materials, um, much more conscientious use of materials will help reduce the, our, the degree to which we just go out and mine the heck out of the whole planet. So Bob, okay. I think we have two more questions right. teed we're, up and we're yep. coming to the end. Okay. Yep. So Hi, thanks so much. Um, my name is Katherine Harrison. I'm a staff member here in this, um, over in the School of Public Health. And I want to just ask a question going back to like kind of the inspire and inform conversation and um, kind of start with an observation and then ask a practical question hearkening to um, uh, Fred's comment about the practical. But so thinking about kind of um, a third aspect, which like you can inspire and you can inform, and then how do you, um, I don't have an I word, but maybe equip or train or coach, you know? So for example, like for two years, my job was to teach and then train physicians how to talk about climate change and health mm. with their patients at a planning commission meeting and then maybe like at the California assembly or something. And that's because we had a grant to do that. But unless you're in a university class or you have the privilege of coming to an event like this, and even still we're not getting, you know, it takes practice to have those conversations even if it's with your crazy uncle at Thanksgiving or whatever. <laughs> so I guess, do you know of any organizations, especially locally, that are doing sort of that yeoman's work of making the data, you know, translating, brokering the science to application, and then giving people space to mm. practice and coach on those conversations outside of maybe sort of overt political organizing or activism, you know, sort of that space where the general population can um, tap into moving from knowledge and inspiration to applied action. I can, I can talk briefly, but I, I realized in my introduction I went straight into my photo and I didn't actually say like what I do at the university, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is I am in a, a fortunate position where I actually am, am leading a program called the University of Minnesota Climate Adaptation Partnership. Um, and it's an organization that's jointly held with the College of Food, Agricultural, Natural Resource Sciences and Extension. And so I serve as a state's extension specialist for climate science and adaptation, and so have been sort of charged with the role of thinking about how do we communicate critical climate information to the public, um, to a broad range of publics, um, whether those are policymakers, state agency staff, federal agencies, tribal governments, regular old people like you and me. Um, and so we're working on, on building out those resources accessible, um, sum summaries on the impacts, on the state of the science, um, and we actually just recently, through support, actually an internal grant, piloted a program called the Community Climate Communicators Cohort. And we sought nominations from across greater Minnesota um, and had a group of 15 Minnesotans from all walks of life, tax preparers and financial experts through to farmers and university faculty, um, all came together for a cohort where we shared skills, practiced skills, and then resourced them um, with whatever they needed, both mentoring and training and community within their cohort, but also financial resources to actually implement some form of communication, whatever, they got to choose their own adventure. Um, and so in that process, there were all sorts of different things people, those adventures they sought were very different from sitting down with a city council member and having their, convincing their you know, electeds to basically make their city a green step city and make some climate commitments 
through to um, kind of events like this, as well as some one-on-one -on -one kind of conversations that would have been maybe otherwise difficult to have. So small scale, but um, I know there are others, and, and Jessica's um, group is doing a ton in this space as well, and there's lots of others, but that's one, one example at the university where we're, we're trying to stand up both the training and creating that safe communal space. Um, and they, the participants did report um, increased confidence in their abilities to have an effective place-specific conversation around climate that mattered for their audience. So that's an example, but I'd love to hear more about what you're doing because- And is that gonna continue? Or we're, yep, we're working on integrating that into a program called Community Climate Leaders. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. So if you'll, if you'll all give us just a couple more minutes we'll get a quick question over here and a quick answer from here. And ho hopefully a quick answer. When we talk about electrifying everything on a daily basis, where's all the electricity coming from? Um, well, we definitely, the, the grid has to improve. There's no question about it. Um, and um, one of the challenges with that is adding more transmission lines, which take a long time to approve and nobody wants in their backyard. Um, so it's not gonna happen tomorrow, right? I mean, if everybody, updated in the next couple of years, it, it wouldn't work, right? But it, it's definitely gonna go. Specifically, I'm talking about fossil fuels. Are we just moving the fossil fuels just going to another so, source? If you're in oh, the Excel yes. service oh, district, do you wanna say no, something about the, so if you're in the Excel service district, for example, what is it now? You're getting about 20, I'd have to get the numbers, I don't have them right in front of me, 20, 25%? 25% um, solar and wind is uh, coming through Excel lines. Uh, here in the next few years, the two remaining coal power plants will go offline, so there will be no uh, coal-fired uh, electricity generation going to Excel customers. There is nuclear power coming, uh, you know, Excel has nuclear power plants that are supplying power. So there will be a shift from coal production, there will be some natural gas um, Excel wants to do that's a little bit controversial whether we should stick with that plan. Um, but there's wind and solar yeah. development uh, will, will replace that uh, coal yeah. power plant. If you're in a slightly different service district, like there are some uh, co-ops that even have a higher penetration of renewable energy than Excel does. They're moving their coal, and they're going to wind and so forth. Yep. They handle 25, or 28, she just corrected me, 25, uh, 28 co-ops. Yeah. Yep. You can live in parts of the yep. cities, and you think it's Excel, it's not. It's great river yes. energy. Yes. Right. And handling that type right. of thing. But right. they are moving away from, right. into more. Right. Yeah. Uh, Very similar path to Excel, um, to So generally, they're being replaced with wind and solar. In a short answer. And natural gas a little bit. Yeah, it will take us a while, but it's probably every industry in Minnesota is doing that, probably across the country as well, because costs have changed. So anyhow, we, this could go on for a long time. Please join me in uh, thanking our panelists today. <laughs> and, and hopefully you were inspired, and we'll go have a conversation <laughs> with someone and make a difference. But thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the spring. Drive safely home and have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, thank you. Talk to that crazy.